Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Hello, everybody. My name is Tino Bredden, and I'm here today uh, to tell you a little bit more about uh, RPC security, privacy implications of using an RPC endpoint, and how you can actually improve your DAP to be more private for your users. At Hopper, we care deeply about privacy. More specifically, we care about transport privacy. And that means IP addresses and the kind of metadata which users are normally not exposed to. Users normally know about their data, which is encrypted, and they feel safe. But underneath, there is a big chunk of metadata which is exposed left and right while we use the internet by companies and governments alike to expose users and their privacy and gain whatever value they want. So at Hopper, we actually want to prevent any third party to use that kind of metadata to, to um, different value. What I want to show you today is uh, how that relates to RPC endpoints, so Ethereum specifically. Hopper itself is not specifically targeting the Ethereum space or RPC endpoints, so this is a subset of use cases which we are looking at. And since we are at a hackathon about Ethereum dApps, I want to show you why dApp developers should care about this. And in order to do that, we will look at a tool which we wrote a while back, which is called Derp. It's hosted on derp.hoppernet.org, so all of you can test it, test it out as well. It's a public tool which is basically mimicking an RPC endpoint, or an RPC provider, how it's sometimes called. Uh, we call it the dump Ethereum RPC provider, because what it does is, for every request it receives, it will actually perform the request normally, like every other endpoint will do for you, but it will also stream the request back to you as a log on this website, so as user, if you're on this website, you will see actually what's going on. So it transparently shows you which requests are being made through your wallet. So let's try it out um, just really quick to see what kind of baseline data we get when we use our wallet. So right now, um, we don't see anything because I just load the website, I didn't use my wallet yet, right? So let me open my wallet. So I'm a normal wallet user. I have a couple of accounts which I have separated nicely um, for different purposes. I never interacted between these accounts um, so that each account stays actually independent and safe. And also from the outside, if you look at on-chain data, you wouldn't recognize that these accounts belong to me. So if I use these accounts and do anything with it, obviously uh, MetaMask will work. Normally, I could send something to my other account, and everything is nice. Now I want to connect all of this to Derp. Derp has some instructions which you can follow. This is readable, make it bigger. So I'm gonna follow the instructions for Gnosis Chain because each of those accounts has some funds in Gnosis Chain, so it's easy to show. What we need to do is we actually have to register Derp as a network in MetaMask. So the most important bit is the RPC URL. I'm gonna remember the chain ID as well as the currency symbol and register it. We go to add network. We add a new network. We call it derp. I'm copy pasting the URL which I got from the derp website and enter all other data. Ah, let me just go back because I did that already. Cool. Um, so you can see the network which I which I registered as a custom network in MetaMask. MetaMask doesn't come with that, right? So if I choose that in MetaMask, it's going to use Derp as its RPC endpoint. Cool. So let's do that. And here we select, great. So all of a sudden, before I chose derp, I didn't see any data obviously on derp, 
But now that I'm using derp as my, as my RPC endpoint, derp will show me what MetaMask is asking for. And this is where uh, my alarm bells kind of go off, right? Now I can see whichever RPC endpoint I'm using will also receive these kind of calls. Now all of this looks very in innocent. Here we already see some get balance and get block number uh, calls with uh, get balance for actually two accounts, which is weird because I'm only connected with one account at the moment. But okay, so I'm gonna scroll all the way down, switching accounts, trying to do some stuff, and here we go. So I switch to my separate account, which I always made sure on-chain is never connected to my first account, but still, the RPC endpoint will be able to connect these two very easily now, because all of these calls are visible on the RPC endpoint, so I expose myself as a user right away uh, without even having any on-chain data connecting that. Right? This is purely IP metadata associated with HTTP calls being made to the RPC endpoint. And this is a problem, obviously, because as a user, this is fully intransparent. I'm actually expecting that these accounts are safe, well disconnected, but under the hood, it's very easy on the first login into your wallet that all of this gets exposed on the other side. And this is what we want to solve tonight by using Hopper, or more specifically, by using what we call RPCH. So Hopper essentially will help users to disconnect that link, which the other side, in this case RPC endpoints, or whatever other infrastructure you're using, can make between your usage of the internet or those endpoints. RPC over Hopper, in short, RPCH, basically tries to do that very specifically for RPC endpoints. So what's going to happen now, um, I will show that in, a, in, a, in code and in a demo shortly, is that we are going to use the RPCH SDK in a DAP to make RPC requests via the Hopper network. And this way, disconnecting, basically unlinking the user from its IP address, and therefore, on the other side, RPC endpoint providers cannot associate the usage between those accounts anymore. So that way, users are fully secure. Their on-chain data is separate if they have been careful, but also their IP metadata is separate so that they can actually safely use um, the Ethereum ecosystem. So in order to do that, we look at an example. I've prepared a dApp, um, which you can reach on GitHub. It's open source. It's a very basic uh, application which will um, use block data and get the logs from those blocks and basically act a, as an explorer um, for logs data on chain. So, um, the repository, let me Let's go back quickly and load that repository for you. It's a really simple dApp. And I'm lazy, so I'm not gonna code as much as my uh, as previous workshop posts, uh, which were great. Now everybody already knows how to build the dApp. Um, this dApp is comparatively simple. It only contains, so the repository contains two branches. Branch main holds the basic DAP version, right? No integration with RPCH. This is basically how pretty much every DAP is built nowadays. It uses direct access to an RPC endpoint. So we'll look at that. And then we look at the branch RPCH, which will showcase how we can integrate RPCH SDK into that easily and basically turn that DAP into a metadata secure DAP. I already cloned the repository. Um, I'm on main, so first off, I obviously need to get the NPM dependencies, and we've seen before, after we got those, we can start our application. This is gonna um, load the application. 
So what's happening in the application, it basically tries to follow the head of the chain, in this case, Gnosis chain, and it will show which block is currently the latest and some previous blocks. If we look at what we see in that block, we see a couple of transactions, and we can also see the transaction data. So all of this is very simple. It's just basic usage of uh, the JSON RPC protocol of an Ethereum provider. If we look specifically what's actually happening under the hood, we see there are calls being made to an endpoint called rpc.gnosischain.com. So this is a public endpoint um, being hosted by um, Gnosis itself. And we can see here that it's a very basic, obviously, ETH underscore block number call um, with um, within the normal wrapping, JSON RPC wrapping. And the response very clearly uh, comes back. This is continuously doing that. And if we then try to do something else and look at the transaction itself, it's going to do some more. Cool. OK. So this is straight up very simple. You can look at the code. We will not look at the code of the entire DAP. Um, it's a very simple uh, application. You can copy paste easily. What we want to do instead is we want to look at how can we turn this into something which is actually private from an RPC perspective. So let us actually look at how we can make this private. I have to install dependencies again. And then we will start it. Uh, that was the wrong one. And reload. OK, cool. So it's starting, but something is not working. So let's look at what actually has changed. So this is the module which is being used by the DAP to load data from an RPC endpoint, right? Initially, in the original version, we can look at um, the diff easily here. In the original version, this was a very simple HTTP RPC client, right? It's basically two-line initialization, and that's it. So what we have to do now is we have to replace that initialization with something which calls RPCH instead of calling the RPC endpoint directly. So what we have to do is we have to initialize RPCH in code, and then we have to pass every request through RPCH. So let's walk through how we can, how we can do that in code. So first off, we have to obviously import RPCH itself, right? It's a single um, object which we have to import from the SDK, which is called SDK, and we will use it for initialization and then um, later on for all the requests. We stick with our original RPC, and that's important. So while we use RPCH, RPCH is really just the transport level middle layer, so to say, where we route everything through, but at the end, RPC requests will still be executed against gnosischain.com, right? So if you trust gnosischain.com um, to give you most up-to-date data, complete data, then you can still do that. Um, but instead of going directly, you will go through RPCH. Then there is what we call the RPCH options. And there are right now two options which you have to set, um, which you should care about as a developer. Option number one is force zero hop. What that means is within the hopper network, you're not going through many intermediate hops. I will explain later what that means um, for staging and development. You obviously want the lowest latency you can get, um, which is zero hop, so it will only go through two hopper nodes. And, and to enable this, we force it to use zero hop. 
As a provider, we set obviously um, the Gnosis chain provider from earlier. And then, and this is what is actually currently breaking the app, we have to set an RPCH token. So obviously, um, RPCH, um, you cannot use it without authenticating your DAP, because that would expose it to uh, a lots, of, lots of malicious uh, usage. So what you have to do is you have to go as a developer on access.rpch.net. Let's quickly check. And here you can register yourself and obtain an API token. Now everybody here in the audience and at ETH Berlin should have gotten one of those uh, codes which you can use on this website to get, to get your account going. Um, within your goodie bag, there's a, a small flyer for RPCH and it will contain a, very, a unique code which only you can use to register. So you go ahead and do that. I've pre-registered already. So I've got my API token, which I can copy paste in here. Okay. So API token is set. Now we can initialize the SDK with the token itself and the options. And then the important bit is um, within our create client, which is a VM specific um, function. Uh, VM is basically our, our library, which we use in this example to access the RPC endpoint. There are many more like ethers and WAGMI. Um, but we use VM, so here you have to create a custom transport, which intercepts requests being made. And then we have to basically turn them into RPCH requests and send them through the SDK. This sounds difficult, but it's really, as you can see, just a two-line uh, operation. So if you copy-paste this, these two lines, I just added a couple more comments. Um, you are very, very easy to get started, and it's going to work right out of the box. So what we do is we basically randomize the ID being used in the JSON RPC um, call, and then we send it through RPCH right here. We get the response back. We uh, decode the response into JSON, and then we return the JSON object again, right? So very simple. It's just necessary because uh, we have to do this interception um, first and then send it through the SDK instead of going directly to the Ethereum endpoint. OK, great. So I've set the RPC H token. So now we can try again. Maybe I have to reload. No. OK. So we can already see some activity, right? Um, we can see blocks are being uh, fetched. We can see we can follow hat. And on the right-hand side, we actually see there's something going on. Um, we can look at the block data. And we actually get the right data. Now, interestingly, if you've noticed, on the right-hand side in the Network Explorer, we don't see the RPC calls directly anymore. What we see now is some weird messages and pop all calls. So let's look into that. OK. So this doesn't look like a JSON RPC request anymore. right? Um, what happens here is that RPCH actually already encrypts and splits up that HTTP call and sends it through the Hopper network. You can, you can see some more about this by looking at where this call actually is going. It's going to some hopper, hopper node where it's posting the message into. We call this the entry point into the Hopper network, the entry node. And this will route the message through the Hopper network to an exit node, which will then ultimately execute the RPC call. So all it's doing is sending those messages, which are basically encrypted HTTP calls, so the hopper nodes cannot see what's going on. And it tries to fetch new messages coming back from the exit node, which has actually executed the RPC request. So all of this is working nicely. What you can already see, though, and this is something associated with uh, using uh, network in between, right, which provides some privacy on the transport layer, uh, there's some added latency. I mentioned that we're using zero hop, 
So the latency is still OK. We can use the DAP. But we do see the loading, and it takes a little longer than it used to when we actually directly called the RPC endpoint. But seemingly, from the X perspective, it's not a problem. But still, now, we have actually private access to an RPC endpoint by adding 10 lines of code um, to our DAP. So looking back at the architecture, really quick, because I only glanced over it. So what we just saw is actually, um, we use the RPC SDK, RPCH SDK in our DAP. The wallet in this case is not a wallet. We actually worked on the DAP. And the SDK made requests to some hopper node, which it identified using what we call the discovery platform. All of this is done by the SDK automatically. So as a DAP developer, you don't have to take care of that. Then it will be routed through the hopper network to some exit node. The routing is also fully automatic. And the exit node will finally execute those RPC requests. Now, the important bit is on the entry side, uh, between RPCH, so between your web browser, your DAP, and the entry node, the requests are, for one, encrypted, because we don't want the hopper nodes on this side to see what uh, RPC requests we are making. So that's why we only saw the, the cryptic content in the request itself. And they're also split up. So for a single RPC request, we might actually see two, five, or 10 messages being sent through the Hopper network. The reason for that is, within the Hopper network, um, every packet has the same length. So if we send large RPC, uh, HTTP requests, these can actually be very large, especially the responses can be very large. So these are chunked up into many messages, which are all encrypted, and then sent over the Hopper network from the entry node to the exit node and back. That's why when you actually debug in the network view, you might see for one, which seemingly is one HTTP request, you might see many messages going through. Now this is all good and nice, but um, let's try something. So I, I showed you earlier derp, right? So derp is the proxy, again, the transparent proxy, which kind of shows you which RPC requests are being made. So what I want to try now, and I didn't try that before, is I want to use derp as the RPC endpoint within my DAP and see what's actually happening. So we are going back to main. I'm going to replace the main Gnosis endpoint with derp. And then I can start again. Okay. That works. Cool. So the DAP is working, and great. We actually see the logs in Derp as well. So that means Derp can see my requests, just like before when I used the wallet and Derp, and uh, what I'm doing in the DAP. And also my wallet, actually. I should turn off my wallet so we don't get confused here. Let's not do that. All right. So. Where is actually the Explorer? So let me make some more requests. We look at the logs, we look at transactions, and so on. And we do see, indeed, there are some additional requests being made to get the transaction data and to get the block data um, from, from the RPC endpoint. This is what I expected, right? Derp is showing me what my dev is doing. So what we are going to do now is we switch back to our RPC enhanced DAP, RPC H enhanced DAP, and we will also use DERP as our RPC endpoint. And what should happen? 
obviously, my expectation as a developer is, at this point, Derp shouldn't try anything anymore because my DAP is routing everything through RPCH, and Derp shouldn't be able to associate anything anymore. It's unlinked. So let's try that. Okay, so this is good. We are using derp instead of gnosis chain directly. And the token we have to set again. Right. So we're installing whatever needs installing, and then we start. So. Let's first check that the DAP is working. So what we've done now is we have our DAP. We've set it up to use RPCH. So all the RPC requests are being routed through the Hopper network. And at the other hand, we are using DERP, which is our transparent proxy, which will lock back to us on the website whatever RPC request it sees and which are associated with my IP right now, right? So let's look at derp. Actually going to reload, that makes it easier. Okay, let's make some more requests. Obviously the dap is working, I'm making requests, everything looks nice, but derp doesn't show any data anymore, right? Derp is not able to associate my outgoing IP with the RPC calls coming into Derp because through RPCH, I unlinked those. This is exactly what we want DAP developers to be able to do very easily um, using RPCH. Okay. So in this case, Derp is on the right-hand side, the third-party RPC provider. On the left-hand side, we had our DAP, and those were unlinked. And as a DAP developer, I'm happy because I can actually provide my users a DAP which doesn't expose metadata anymore, uh, the metadata of my users. And the user, as a user, I'm happy because I can safely use a DAP even for accounts which are separate on chain, which will stay separate on, on the transport level as well. So just a few words about Hopper, since I only glanced over it. Um, so Hopper is a decentralized packet relay network. We're, we are trying to hide IP metadata and other metadata on the transport level from endpoints or users with, or governments, companies, which are interested in looking at that data to turn users into value for them or exploit them uh, through other means. What happens is a message going into the network, in this case to Alejandro, uh, from Alejandro to Zoe, which will re be relayed through many hops in the network. And uh, this relaying actually happens on a per packet basis, always through a different path. This is very important. If we, for instance, have an RPC request, as I mentioned, which can be large or a response, which might turn into 10 messages, these 10 messages will never follow the, follow the same path through the Hopper network. These 10 messages will actually go through different routes, making it even harder for anybody to follow what's going on or, and identify the packet flow in the network. An important part of Hopper is that it's a mixed net and that means on every individual node, these packets are in addition being mixed together so that the incoming order and timing and the outcoming order and timing cannot be connected anymore if you look at it from the outside, right? So 
the order is being mixed up, as well as latency is being added, so that the order of outgoing packets cannot directly be linked to the incoming order anymore, making it even harder for an adversary who has access to that peer from the outside, from the network level, to infer what's going on. And then we have uh, what we call the proof of relay. Um, the hopper network is incentivized, meaning um, there's incentive for every hop in that mixnet, for every peer, to actually do the relaying forwarding so that um, users both gain by playing nice and helping relaying, and we can also make sure that uh, we can ensure nobody's actually um, trying to game the system. All in all, I mentioned earlier, Hopper is actually useful not only for RPC endpoint protection, but for many other use cases. Um, but generally, the, the RPC edge itself can be used by any dApp in the Ethereum space um, to protect the users on the metadata level uh, very easily now um, in many spaces. So I'm ver very much looking forward on what's happening at East Berlin. Um, generally, the Hopper network itself is obviously very low tech, or no, high tech on a low layer uh, technology, which uh, makes it hard to grasp and to actually use in a higher level end user application, and that's why we build RPCH. We want to make it really easy for a developer to say, yes, I want privacy for my user, users on all levels, including the transport level, and therefore RPCH um, has been created to make that a 10-line integration. Um, with that, I want to conclude the workshop. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. Um, please check out the GitHub repository. It's all copy-pastable. All you have to do is take your voucher in your um, goodie bag, go to access.rpch.net and get your API token, and you could uh, have a private dApp within 10 minutes. Thanks. Anyone has maybe follow-up questions or clarification requests? Yes, thank you for the for the nice talk. Um, I have two questions. Like one is maybe a little, little bit philosophical. Like why do you think no one, none of the other RPC endpoint providers do something like this? And the second question is you mentioned that Hopper offers better privacy than VPNs, um, but you guys are also building a VPN, right? Or something like that. How does that work then? Okay, yeah. Very good questions. So question number one, uh, why do RPC providers not Offer privacy. Um, I mean, for one, RPC providers have a, have a very clear business um, uh, proposal, right? They want to give you blockchain data as fast as possible and as, as often as possible, right? So uh, obviously for them, it's, uh, um, it's important to have the highest bandwidth and throughput they can get and be as, on their end, as, uh, as efficient as possible. Um, from my perspective, pretty much every RPC provider sticks to that, right? This is a business and that's all they want to do. Um, we're actually trying to convince RPC providers to run um, what we've seen as exit nodes uh, within the network in front of their RPC endpoints, um, making it um, less um, directly exposable, like the IP metadata of the user and uh, still utilizing the trust link, because what we can underestimate is the trust link a user has actually to an RPC provider. Everybody trusts Infura because Infura helped scale the Web3, right? So there's a, a lot of trust already established from that perspective and many other RPC providers. So there's a way to actually combine those two, RPC providers still being able to follow their normal routine, but uh, by having integrated into, our, into the RPCH network and therefore um, being accessible through a private link. Um, but there is still a long way to go. It's possible, um, and I'd be happy to talk to providers about that for sure. Um, regarding your second question, you're referring to the Gnosis VPN. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, a VPN very clearly is more of a proxy of your, um, of your internet access. So you basically trade using your own IP against using another IP which your VPN provider gives you. Uh, the important bit here is you're actually going to trust that our VPN provider now. Uh, you have to trust them. 
So, um, and this is something where the trust assumptions often uh, are not highlighted well enough. And uh, also, you are then mixed up with others who are using that single IP possibly, uh, which, uh, which uh, doesn't help your, um, your privacy more. What we want to do with Gnosis VPN is we actually want to use the Hopper network as the foundational uh, transport network. Uh, giving you the same usability of a VPN because everybody understands VPNs and that's great. But uh, having no trust assumption at all on the transport layer, you don't have to trust a single entity, right? Um, and on the, on the outside, it will always look like tens or hundreds of IPs doing the calls to the outside world. So you're not just using a single IP which a VPN provider gives you, but you're using all of the IPs used in the Hopper network potentially um, as your exit, which is obviously 10 or 100 fold or 1,000 fold better in that case. There is at least one more question. Okay. They, like you submitted for 45 minutes, they're going to use all 45 Go ahead. minutes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, does the exit know basically knows everything about you because it has to know to, where to send the, the response back and also <laughs> have, to have the full clear, clear text request to be able to access the regular uh, server? Very good question. Um, so what RPCH does basically, it has uh, in the messages it sends out, the, the cryptic messages it sends out, it has basically um, uh, the post-it stamp or the return address in it. So what the hopper node does is when my hopper node sends uh, the RPC request to you, um, I know your PRD, so I'm gonna send it to you, but I'm going to include my PRD so you can send the response back to me. But uh, on that level, you don't know anything about the browser or the user which has actually sent the RPC request. You only know that the response is going to my hopper node and then my hopper node is being used by the browser DAP instance uh, to then put back the response together and display it in the DAP. So we unlink those two parts so that the hopper nodes really only know that they talk to each other and the entry node knows where the user actually came from and the exit node obviously knows where the request is going because it has to execute it, um, but it cannot connect it anymore to the originator. Anyone? Oh, yeah, good work. Keep it up. Yes, uh, when you started the presentation, you showed how MetaMask uh, asks a lot of stuff that it shouldn't be asking and how it asks it you know, in, in clumps. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way to make MetaMask use this? Great question. There is a way. So um, we actually did some um, proof of concepts for other wallets. Um, which you can find on our GitHub rep repositories. Um, for MetaMask, it's a little bit more complex because MetaMask has what uh, they call MetaMask snaps. Um, so you actually, when you want to extend MetaMask uh, uh, through, uh, let's say, a plugin like that, uh, you would have to build a snap. And now, um, we, have, we have made a proposal to MetaMask, a uh, so-called so, so snap improvement proposal, which would provide the capabilities needed in MetaMask so we can just write the snap. We know exactly what we need to write. Um, it would be technically right now possible, um, but the snap needs to, be, needs to be approved and ultimately implemented in MetaMask to make it work. So um, yeah, the more users will, who support the SIP, uh, the better, because then maybe we can get it into MetaMask and make it an option for users to use it. Okay, thanks very much for the question, the attention, and uh, have a great ETH Berlin. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, guys, so we have five minutes.